Hi, this is the Social Jello with Angelo show. My name's Angelo. I'm a social scientist, surfer, martial artist, and a whole lot of other things. Coming to you live from Kasai City, Japan, the Social Jello with Angelo show. What's up? This is Angelo. Thanks for checking out Social Jello with Angelo. I'm here with Steven. And Steven, I have a horrible tendency to fuck people's names up in the beginning of the show. Lambert? You got it. Steven yes. Lambert. Nice. I'm getting better at this. <laughs> okay, so Steven. Steven is the author of The Streets of Brooklyn to the Halls, from the Streets of Brooklyn to the Halls of Hollywood. Um, now, Steven, you've done a lot of work as a stuntman, as a martial artist. And like I was telling you off camera, I wanted to open up with your book because um, some people just check out, this is a long podcast, so people just check out this first intro. So I just want to show them real quick where they can find the book here. Yeah. So here we are. Here we are here on the, on the interwebs. Um, we so here's talk about it a little bit. Yeah. So Stephen, let's start off with this book that you wrote. Um, what's it all about? You know, this is a book like no other book that you've ever read from a producer, from a director, from an actor, from another stuntman, anybody behind camera, in front of camera. I've been in the movie business for uh, 48 years nonstop. And, and I wrote down things. I told you stories behind the scenes in front of camera that you've never even comprehended to understand. Um, you'll enjoy it. Um, it starts out um, uh, when I was a kid in Brooklyn, New York, and I come back to California from Brooklyn, New York. Um, hold on for one second. So one thing I wanted to mention, and I hate to interrupt you, yes. I think my fans and I think a lot of the people that follow my show are going to recognize your work. More, like when I was looking at your bio, you've worked on some really big really big titles but the ones that the my people are going to understand the martial artists because most of the people watch the martial arts revenge of the ninja american ninja those ninja series um that whole ninja series you were the silver ninja right and well, that, that's what a lot of the people from my like when i mentioned to some of the people that i train with um that that really popped out to them so like <laughs> so for anyone watching He's the American ninja. <laughs> he's, 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 a series he's, of uh, ninja pictures for Canon Film. Revenge of the Ninja, Ninja 3, The Domination, and American Ninja 1. And in Revenge of the Ninja, I also played the Silver Mask Ninja. Um, Arthur um, was a wonderful person, wonderful guy, good actor. But, uh, and uh, um, my life is full of teaching students, but... but uh, he was the kind of a person where uh, he was unteachable. And again, he was a wonderful guy, but he was unteachable. So he got stuck um, because he had a tremendous amount of fighting to do. And um, uh, being that he always wore that mask, uh, my beloved director said, Steve, you know, you just play him whatever it has to do with the mask. And I was him the whole show because there was only three times you saw him in the mask is when he put it on and when he put it on again with the grandma and then at the end i have a cut of when shokazuki slices the mask in half right before right when he kills him and it reveals arthur all the other stuff it was me and it was a brilliant idea i came up with the character i came up with the uh fighting style and the movements, you know, uh, uh, some of my heroes are people uh, from way back, people like Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Harry, Harold Lloyd. And uh, if you're familiar with those type of characters, putting martial arts in with what they do, you know, I've always believed in long sequences. They believed in long sequences, all their comedy. I just converted all this action, you know, uh, in, into exciting long pieces um, uh, that uh, that I uh, that I've learned from them, watching them, 
um, you know, there's more than watching when you learn, it's understanding uh, and uh, repeating and knowing how to do it. And I talked to some great friends of theirs in the past, other stuntmen that knew them, learned a lot about them. Uh, some other heroes of mine, like James Cagney, Bruce Lee, um, uh, Charlie Chaplin, uh, Harold Lloyd, like I said, Buster Keaton, uh, um, tremendous heroes of mine. And uh, I just put it all together. And these are the sequences that I come up with. I doubled Shokazuki in Revenge of the Ninja, uh, in Ninja 3, The Domination, Lucinda Dickey. I doubled the woman in The Domination. And I got to tell you, uh, you know, in the book, I tell stories like in Revenge of the Ninja. If I sat down with you and watched Revenge of the Ninja with you, I can give you uh, 101 times uh, where I could say, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. Um, because they didn't give me much money. And if I wanted to give the audience, I wanted to give the film uh, people, uh, the people watching the film, the things that they would love when it was completed. I had no uh, other way in doing it, but to do it myself because I didn't have the money to, to hire people. So, so that's why you see so much of it because most of the time, you know, all these cuts, whether it's a cop or, or uh, uh, just an ND person or another nondescript ninja, you know, I, I'm in it an awful lot. In every movie, in all three of the movies, uh, I doubled Michael Dudikoff in American Ninja One. I doubled um, Tadashi Yamashita in American Ninja One and then played a bunch of other, other ninjas. Uh, you know, there's a, uh, I, I, I explain in the book, there's a very funny story and there's no, in those ninja pictures, I had my own wardrobe person and they had all my wardrobe. I, I, I probably had, oh, 15, 20 ninja outfits and just regular street clothes where wherever I went, those racks of clothes would follow me because I never knew if I had to play an indie ninja or, uh, you know, because sometimes I would hire a local person, but he wouldn't be able to do something I'd want. So I put on the clothes or the, or the uh, you know, bad ninja, the indie, indie ninja who's fighting the super ninja or the cop, you know. So it was a running gag, you know, make sure Lampert's... Uh, clothes racks, follow them wherever they go, you know? So, uh, you know, they were precious movies and they were some of my first. And uh, it takes a team. Always remember this, your audience out there, it takes a team to make a good product. It t takes people who really enjoy their work. You know, they're not really interested in making the money, the money's nice but they want a good product. Even if it's a, a B script, you can make it memorable, just like I did in those ninja pictures. Uh, you, had, you work with the right people. I had a wonderful director, Sam Furstenberg. I had a wonderful DP on all three of them. They were all three different, but they were all wonderful. Um, they cared. Uh, they let me work. They understood how important uh, I was, God bless, um, to these films um, because I was also the writer when it came to all the action. The script, whenever it came to all the, the uh, action, uh, no other company ever did this with me. They would leave it blank. Canon Films, Menachem Golan, Sam Firstberg would leave all the action blank and I would write it in. Uh, and it was a tremendous learning experience and it kicked me off in the future. If I wouldn't have done the things that I've done on those ninja pictures are, it's very rare that a stunt person gets a chance in his lifetime to have so much to, to be offered so much responsibility in a film. You know, it's just not done. And in those pictures, people like Sam Furstenberg, David Walmart, Menachem Golan, um, they gave it to me. 
um, you very rarely work on a movie like that. And, you know, the ninjas were my first three pictures and, you know, it was a gold mine in experience. Uh, you must have great common sense when you're a stunt coordinator. And I was gifted with uh, wonderful common sense. And uh, uh, the things I didn't have to make what I produced on film uh, was because of uh, the people that I mentioned, you know, script food supervisor, Ronit, you know, she's very important to the film. Um, you know, so with these people that I mentioned, gave me the gift, uh, listened to me, understood where I was coming from. And I was lucky enough to be a stunt coordinator who also did stunts, you know, there are not a lot of stunt coordinators that also do stunts. So I was a gift to them. And uh, um, we just had a, just a wonderful time. You know, Shokazuki and Revenge of the Ninja, um, that was really his first movie. Yes, he did Enter the Ninja, but he wasn't involved. He wasn't the star. It's really different. And uh, we got along wonderful. Um, he was wonderful to work with, easy to work with on Revenge of the Ninja because he came from live shows. He used to work at Magic Mountain. You work in live shows and you make people believe it's just like working in front of camera. So, you know, I didn't have to teach him a lot. A lot of times, you know, like Michael Dudikoff or Lucinda Dickey, I had to teach, you know, Shokazuki, I only had to teach certain things. I, I had to teach him camera angles. I had to teach him to perform in front of camera. You know, a lot of actors have a bad habit of not understanding performance, uh, performance acting. You know, uh, I'll give you an example uh, in performance acting. Gene Kelly, a dancer. Fred Astaire, a dancer. They're performance actors. They perform with their body, you know. Martial artists should perform with their body. Bruce Lee was a performance actor. Very few martial artists, uh, movie martial artists are performance actors. They don't understand, you know, but, but uh, Shoki, Shokazuki, he was easy to teach. Um, so we had a wonderful time. Uh, a lot of, in the book I explain, we played uh, a lot of jokes on each other, you know, uh, Shokazuki just came from a foreign country. So he didn't understand American humor. And I come from Brooklyn, New York. And uh, I love humor. And I can take it and I can give it. So Sam Furstenberg, David Walmart, myself, we would play, and Shokazuki, we played joke, jokes on each other. But Shokazuki never understood it was a joke. We never used to tell him. So at first, he just didn't get it until we explained it to him or if he was involved in it and we didn't tell him because we never, whoever was playing a joke on somebody, we wouldn't tell anybody else. In other words, if I was playing a joke on Chokazuki, I wouldn't tell David Walmart or Sam Furstenberg. But when the joke occurred, they knew, they understood it. But Chokazuki would never understood it, stand it at first. And I explain it a lot in the book and you'll laugh your ass off. Um, the friendship was so tight on Revenge of the Ninja. But then when we got to the domination, it was different. And I explained it in the book. Um, Menachem and Chokazuki had some problems on future projects. So I explained what occurred when he came back on, uh, on uh, Ninja the Domination. I won't get into that. Ask me some more questions. All right. So, yeah. And like I said, I'm glad you you, you put that out there because a, a lot of my listeners come from martial arts backgrounds and they recognize your work in the ninja movies. Um, if you out there, your audience, uh, just a second, your audience, if you want, if you're a fan of those ninjas and other motion pictures that I've done, get my book because I'll, there are stories 47, 48 years worth of stories in that book from, from big films, major motion pictures, 
major actors from Arnold Schwarzenegger to Stice Stallone to James Woods, you know, to directors uh, like Scorsese, uh, Al Pacino. I mean, I can go on and on. Uh, Van Damme, Seagal. You want to know the real story between Seagal and uh, Jean LaBelle? I tell you the real story in the book. Only I tell you the truth. Nobody else. The real story is in the book. Well, yeah. And like I said, that's definitely... Um, here, let me close that out real quick. All right. So what I wanted to ask you... Um, yes. So a lot of martial artists, and I've had this talk, I've had this conversation with with other uh, recently another G Kundo guy. Being a martial artist and making a career through martial arts is not easy. <laughs> it, it, it is not. It is not easy, right? It, it is not easy. It's it's <laughs> it, right? if, if you if you if you you know looking at even Bruce Lee's story. Um, there was a point there in his life where he was living inside of uh, he he was married and and he I believe his first kid was on the way and he still didn't he's still making ends meet uh, living at one of his students houses. And um, so there's there's it's not easy if, 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 a, if a legend like Bruce Lee had a hard time. Where are we in, in the middle of all this? Right. So, like, my question to you is, how did you get from. And you don't have to disclose too much. And this is why I want people to read your book. So <laughs> I'll keep that in mind as you answer my question. But how did you go from just a guy doing martial arts in Brooklyn? I guess my first question, what got you into martial arts? What, what got you started? What, what inspired you to start doing it? You know, I talk about that in the book. I, I, I talk about a lot of things before I got um uh, into martial arts. And it was important because I, I've grown up, uh, you know, I wasn't middle class, I wasn't high class, I was low class. You know, I grew up in the streets of Brooklyn, New York in the 50s. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm 68 years old out there. I'm an old man. Um, but uh, but uh, I grew up in the streets. And back then, everything was clean. You know, it wasn't knives, it wasn't guns. If you fought, you fought with your fists. And after you fought, you make friends with each other. It's nothing like now. Um, um, but uh, um, I wasn't very smart. You know, uh, I always uh, uh, tell people, I tell people like you, I tell the audience out there, you know, the only A I ever got was in gym class. Everything else was C's, D's and F's. <laughs> You know, that's the only A I ever got. Um, I didn't have any direction. Didn't know where I was going, right? I mean, I had so many jobs, you know, working in restaurants, cleaning things, uh, you know, making mustard and ketchup packets at machine factories, um, uh, making pizza, working in restaurants. You know, I, I had a, you know, a lot of just, regular jobs, didn't have a direction. Then I found martial arts and I was always a monkey when I was a kid. You know, I was voted the, the second fastest runner and the first best climber. You know, we used to play games running over fences and challenging each other. You know, for kids, I, I won the John F. Kennedy Award in physical fitness in public school, um, in gym. You know, they gave me an encyclopedia in sixth grade, you know? So, uh, but I, I didn't know where to take it. You know, I wanted to be a baseball player, but I didn't know how. Um, parents weren't smart enough to direct me, you know? So I was a lot like other people, um, uh, but I had luck. And, uh, you know, I, I like to think I had uh, the Lord with me, God, you know, as a piece of that. And uh, I used to get into a lot of mischief, not trouble, just, mischievous you know but uh, you, you know but but somehow never in trouble and then from brooklyn i went to california and that's where i found uh, really martial arts and uh and uh, uh i explain in the book how i found it and it's very fascinating how i found it um and then when i started taking it 
I realized that uh, people were noticing me for the first time in my life. Teachers were noticing me. Uh, you know, other people in the classes, higher higher belts were noticing me. They took me under their wing. You know, they they worked hard with me. You know, and I enjoyed it because it was something that I liked and that I enjoyed, that I excelled. Went to tournaments and and uh, and uh, it just enriched enriched me. I didn't know why, right? And, and what um what style did you start training in first? I I started training in Silam Kung Fu White Lotus. My master is Douglas Wong, very well known master in the world, um, and, and that's another thing I was blessed on. Uh, you know, just just finding and again I explained it in the book. Um, you know, it's very lighthearted, uh, very movie like the way I my whole book is very movie like. You know, I I I put you into my head and I talk to you, uh, not like I'm writing a book. You know, everything you're gonna read in the book is like how we're talking right now. And uh, I sometimes I jump from one thing to another, but I always come back uh, because one thing always leads to another. But I always come back to it and move on um, and tell that story later on. So it jumps back and forth a lot. So you never get tired of it. But uh, then I like I said, then I found martial arts and people noticed me. And then, uh, uh, you know, for years, tournaments, demonstrations, I lived and breathed martial arts. In fact, uh, you know, uh, Doug gave uh, 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 a certain amount of us keys. We used to sleep there. You know, our, our parents knew where we were um, all the time, so they never worried. Uh, things like that. So, in other words, you live and breathe something you enjoy, that you love, even though you don't know where it's going to take you. You know, I was just I was assuming in my mind I was going to pump gas. That was my was what my life was. And in the very last tournament, I was like uh, 21 years old and I had to start making money because tournaments in martial arts don't make you any money. No, right? yeah, you have to pay. <laughs> you have to pay yeah, to fight. Go up, <laughs> go up, you know, <laughs> so I, I was competing in my very last tournament, took second in three divisions weapons, katas, and fighting. And uh, at the end of it, some people came over to me, casting people. And they said, do you want to be in a movie? And I looked at them and what the hell are you talking about? Well, Chuck Norris is doing a movie um, and uh, we need somebody to fight him. We're looking for people. And we like how you fight. We like how you move. And it went over my head and they said, uh, they said, uh, you, you know, it's going to be an LX, LAX. You're going to fight him, and he, he's going to probably uh, beat you up real quick, but you'll throw three or four punches and kicks. You know, it's going to be in the evening. Uh, we'll pay you $500 under the table. Now, understand, $500 in cash, I mean, I had to work probably a month to get $500 in cash for one night. So I said, yes. I went there and I saw it and I fell in love. And I said, I, I can do this, this is easy. I had no idea how, when or where. And I explained that in the book again. Uh, um, but uh, one thing led me into another and it would take me a long time to explain it. And, and uh, I would go off on tangents, read my book, Steve Lambert from the streets of Brooklyn to the halls of Hollywood, amazon.com. Uh, but that's how I got into martial arts and that's how I got into the movies. Um, some people came over to me, casting people, and they asked me and that's how uh, uh, Chuck Norris people. And that's how uh, uh, I became great friends with Chuck Norris. Um, I explain that in the book. I worked many times with Chuck Norris. We became very good friends. Uh, I tell you very funny stories about Aaron. Norris, Chuck Norris. I worked in many of his movies, just like I worked in many Stallone movies and Arnold movies. And I've acted in movies. I've done stunts in movies. See, very few stunt people could act. And I was one of the few that could do both. And stunt people and directors saw that. So uh, I got a lot of acting parts. Um, 
um, in movies, uh, character parts. And going from, so you coming from a martial arts background. I right? answer your question. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> so coming from a martial arts background and then working in Hollywood with Hollywood yeah. actors, Coming from, a, coming from coming from the streets, right? Coming from from Rock, Brooklyn. It's completely different. Uh, I explain this. This is very important for the audience out there. A lot of big time martial artists think they can come in and stunt coordinate and fight coordinate, right? And they fail. Big names. They don't understand. You have to learn. It's like a school. How to do stunts. It's not only falling in your head. It's knowing lenses. It's knowing camera, it's knowing angles. It, it's, it, you know, there's so many lenses that you have to understand. There's so many speeds you have to understand. There's knowing how to work with, with actors, understanding how to act, understanding where to put people. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And martial artists, be the greatest martial artist in the world. And they try to get into movies and they fail. You have to have a martial artist who understands stunts also. It's important. Yeah. And the point I was, I was going to try to get into is it's a different world, right? So like yes. you're coming from the fighting world because I, 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 I don't know much. I'm not big. Like I'm not really. I did a little bit of modeling and acting when I moved to Japan. I live in Japan, by the way. And. When I went, when I was in that world for a little bit, it was shocking to the, because, you know, I wasn't doing anything martial arts related. I was just trying to make some side money at this modeling gig. And then I ended up with an acting gig. And when they were there and it got the topic of what I do came up and how I run a martial arts gym and, and do all this martial arts stuff, the actors were... Some of them were intrigued. Most of them were scared. Most of them are really, <laughs> most of them do not like the idea. It's like, wait, so you get punched in the face? They could ask me, so you get punched in the face? I'm like, yeah. And, you know, sometimes they do, you know, sometimes I get choked out and I'm teaching this guy this and I, one of my fighters is going to be fighting in a kid. You oh, fight. Wait, wait, wait. wait. They're like, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Yeah, they're like, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Because as actors, they were terrified of something happening to their face because they were like, if something happens to my face, this is how I make money. And you're saying you just voluntarily <laughs> go and do this. So, I mean, I did get along with them. It was, but it was even for me and on a very, very small scale, I realized real quick that it was to me, what I feel is normal <laughs> is not normal at all. So how did you, how did you navigate that? Well, first of all, when I came in, when I learned from some mentors how to do stunts, and everything I speak about, how to learn as far as the stunt, the movie angle. I was a martial artist and I was the same as you, right? We always, depending on who, what we were doing, whether it was a demonstration, right? Or really fighting in a ring, in a tournament. If it was a demonstration, right? You always overemphasize everything. You know, you're demonstrating, you're, or you're putting on a show, right? Like Chinese New Year's, right? when everybody got together and their schools would demonstrate, right? So, so you learned that and we did a lot of that, right? So I understood a little bit about missing and animation and body language, right? Through martial arts, through my style. Also, there's a lot of animals and insects, Northern and Southern. So I had a mixture of a lot of things, a lot of movements, a lot of body language in animals and insects, katas, forms, hand forms, weapons, you know. So, you know, I, I, I learned in the years that I, I was in martial arts, you know, probably, pro, uh, probably um, 15 years nonstop. The 15 years nonstop was probably uh, 70 years of stuff that I learned in 15 years. So I'm going I'm to pause you real quick because yes. you made it. You made a really good. You made it. You made a really interesting point here, and this is something that's always being talked about, especially on my show. Yes, you mentioned forms. You said forms 
Forms are very important. Okay. So forms really help to translate what you do for Hollywood. Would, would you say, which one would you say helped you more, forms or the actual fighting? Remember I told you about body language, performance, acting? The reason why I'm a stuntman and there's 10,000 other stuntmen, right? The reason why I work so much, the reason why I was successful is because of the way I moved doing a stunt, whatever it was, big or small, body language. We have three gates, right? We have three ways to move, three, bo three positions on our body is from our head to our solar plexus, solar plexus to our um, uh, knees, knees to the bottom of, the, uh, of our toes. Those are our three gates. They can move individually or they can move together. Same thing, I talk about Gene Kelly, like for instance, performance art, but watch him, his body movement. He would have made the greatest stuntman in the world if he was a stuntman. And he did a lot of his own stunts, you know? But most stuntmen, when I first started, were just cowboy or car guys. They knew nothing about fighting other, other than John Wayne fighting. That's when I came in, right? Yeah. The haymakers. So, <laughs> so all, the haymakers. The forms, <laughs> all the forms that I learned, all the forms or all the katas that I learned, I took into the movie business and I modified them, right? Like if I had to throw a hook, you know, those guys would be throwing a John Wayne hook and I'd be throwing a martial art hook with style, you know. Um, that's what Bruce believed, body language. He got it, you know. I got what he was trying to do, you know. So I was separated with other few stuntmen, and we excelled when the others didn't. That's why I got a lot of parts, acting parts in the movie, because they saw... You know, that's why, you know, people like James Woods, the actor James Woods, you know, I doubled James Woods. I've been doubling for 35 years. He wouldn't do anything without me. You know, I've uh, I've uh, worked with Seagal. I worked with Vida Van Damme, uh, Jet Li. I worked with all of them uh, in the past. Um, and they always respected me and they always listened to me. Uh, Chuck Norris. Um, uh, uh, I was Brendan Lee's first stunt double. The first TV show he ever worked on. It's blessed. Um, I got uh, um, uh, the dragon. I was the stunt coordinator and the fight coordinator of the dragon, the Bruce Lee story. Jason Scott Lee. I taught uh, uh, Jason how to fight. Um, um, uh, Rutger Hauer in Blind Fury. I mean, I can go on and on. It's because uh, when you, when I was blessed, I learned martial arts. I was a monkey in Brooklyn, New York, uh, very physical, um, you know, 155 pounds, 5'9". Um, uh, and uh, I learned martial arts and I learned how to do it the movie way. And it's important where so many stuntmen teach actors um, the way that the stuntmen, like this guy, whoever's teaching them how to do it. You've got to sit an actor down and say, okay, what do you like doing? Are you a gymnast? Do you have a, are you a dancer? Are you a swimmer? Um, and they'll tell you what they've done in the past. And then you take what their knowledge was of some athletic thing, basketball player, hockey player, right? And you use that and you incorporate that into their style of action. So would you say that at that but point- Forms are you, very you, important. Forms are important. And you're also, you're tapping, you're tapping into, you're tapping into teaching. You're still tapping into as a martial arts instructor. 
In fact, what you're it tapping into is, is really rough because we, 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 we from my martial art background. Yeah, and what, what you're mentioning is really tough, right? Like you're grabbing someone who's essentially a white belt; they know nothing, <laughs> and you have you have like an hour <laughs> or less. How much time? Ten minutes? How much time do they give you to work with someone for a film? Sometimes you're on a TV show and you have five minutes. <laughs> Sometimes you have uh, a day. It just depends. On TV shows, most of the time, you have very little time. Oh, right? fuck. <laughs> uh, on, movies, you have, uh, uh, on movies, you have a lot more time. Matrix, you have six months. Uh, uh, Revenge of the Ninja, you have maybe uh, three days. Again, <laughs> Matrix, you have six months. Revenge of the Ninja, you have three days. So it depends on the stunt coordinator. It's the, you know? None of this, as a, as a martial arts instructor, none of this sounds ideal to me. Like, if you told me I had six months to prepare someone, well, I just, okay, so here's an example. I just had a student come in, say he wants to be a professional kickboxer and he wants to start fighting. And, and like uh, my fight team is constantly getting these emails and he saw one of the emails, like, I want to fight. And I told him, you've only been training for three months. You're going to get killed. Like you want to, you want to fight. He's, he's 15 and he wanted to fight a 36-year-old Muay Thai champion who's retiring. And he's like, but he's older. I'm like, you're 15. He's 35. He's going to kill you. Like, and his mom's like, let him fight. I'm like, do you, like, do you realize this isn't baseball? This isn't baseball. This isn't soccer. Your kid is about to go in and fight a professional fighter who's going to try to literally kill him. Like, he's going to throw elbows. And he's like, yeah, that's okay. It's his dream. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like three months, six months, even for me, I was like, not even six months would say, I'd say he's ready in six months. I, I would still be very hesitant to put a 15 year old, I guess a 35 year old former champion. So like, I think that six months frame to try to get people ready or five minutes, like you said, right. It's that, that takes a lot of, you're really tapping into that that teaching part and you oh, have to really connect quickly. Exactly. This is a movie and the actor has to trust you. The actor has to believe in you first of all. Right. So when you teach an actor to me, the best way to teach an actor to teach anybody, anything in the movie business is being a instructor, a master in a, in a class. I learned that way, right? Specifically how you, you talk, specifically how you teach, specific, specifically how you define a movement. You have to know how to explain it. Actors don't know what the hell you're talking about. How do you get from this movement to that movement? They, they understand how to act with their mouth, to memorize, facial expression, right? But they don't understand how to act with their body. You know, you know it's the old pat, and smooth, pat and smooth, you know, that kind of thing. And some of the actors are very talented. Some of them aren't. They're all wonderful, but some of them are. I'll give you an example. Rutger Hauer, the best actor I've ever taught in my life, right? Such a natural, right? James Woods, my best friend. He's like my big brother, but, and best actor you ever want to work with, right? It's a genius, right? Terrific actor. But as far as action, right? Non-athlete, you know? I'll tell you a story. I live in Los Angeles, California. And there's a mountain called Stony Point, Chatsworth, California. And whenever I teach actors, stars, for a movie, I have a variety of training methods. But there's a mountain called Stony Point, And I take them all. I've taken... Sty Stallone, Rutger Hauer, uh, um, 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 uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, Van Damme, Jet Li, um, uh, uh, Steven Seagal to climb this mountain. James Woods, I name him last. They all said yes, they all climbed. James Woods, when I brought him up the mountain, he said, F you, Steve, I ain't climbing that mountain. I'll train down here. You know, <laughs> some will, some won't. And I say that with love because he's like a big brother to me. He's a good friend. Uh, we're friends to this day. Um, but that's just the way people, you know, he's not an athlete. You know, he's a, a, a book reader, you know, 
Um, he's a college professor. He's a genius, you know, uh, where Stai Stallone is the best actor fighter that's ever been in existence in far, as far as I'm concerned, you know, so there's, there's, there's different, you know, uh, different methods, but you got to know how to teach. You got to know how to explain. You got to know how to break it down into things that people understand. And the most important thing is you got to make it fun. If you don't make it fun, it gets old really fast. So you always got to make it fun, especially with actors because they're so spoiled. Well, brother, we are getting towards the, the last few minutes of the show and something I ask everyone towards the end. This is, this is a question I ask everyone. Yes. Um, for anyone listening who doesn't do martial arts, but is really interested in getting into martial arts, um, what kinds of things would you, rec what, what would you recommend for them what should they be looking out for when they start their training at a place as far as it, what they pick as a place to train at? What, what, would, what would your recommendation be to this person who doesn't do any martial arts, who's interested in doing it? It's a great question. And, and uh, I thought of that an awful lot in the past. And I have a, a good answer is you go to the different schools, right? Whether it's Japanese or Chinese or Korean or any type of Asian art, any type of Caucasian uh, teachers, masters, whatever. You go to the school and you just sit and watch. You watch their white belt class all the way up to their black belt classes, right? And you pick a style that you like because it's not the style, I always say. There's no best style. It's the person. It's the person that's doing it. So you sit there and you look, you go to the Chinese style, you go to the Japanese style, you go to the, you know, the, the all different styles, something's local and you watch the teacher. You see if he teaches well, right? You watch his students, his other black belts, you know, that help him teach his brown belts. And if it's a good environment, um, you learn and, and, you can always go to different classes. In other words, it's good to know different styles. Um, as I learned, you know, I started with um, um, a very rigid style, basic style, Taekwondo. And then after two years, I went into Kung Fu and I realized, you know, that I was lucky that I found an animal and insect style, you know, Northern and Southern hard style and soft style, animals and insects. So I learned a mixture of stuff at the end. So it's, it's, it's good to just, because you're going there for a reason. If you're going there to fight, whether it's, you know, if you're going there to really fight, then I would say, you know, learn your basic punches, basic kicks um, in, a, in a, a Shotokan or a Taekwondo, and then go take Judo, Jiu Jitsu, you know, if you're going to really fight, because those three things will bring you into that. If you're going to work in the movies, get a mixture of stuff. Learn a lot of weapons. Learn a lot of animals and insects, hard style, soft style. The more you learn, the better it is. But whatever you learn, whatever you do it for, you know, I've taught basketball players, baseball players, and they've come tell, and told me, you know, that I'm doing better because I'm taking your training in martial arts. You know, there's, to be a great athlete, this is the last thing I'll say, to be a great athlete in any kind of sport, you have to know five things. Timing, coordination, distance, focus, and power of the mind. If you get those dialed in, you're gonna be great in whatever you do, mentally or physically. Signing off, Stephen Lambert, Take care, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll do it again after he reads some of my book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I, 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 did, uh, yeah. I will not talk to you until you read my book again. That, that, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> and I am. I am. I, I, I will say. I'll you just, will like, love I, it. I read it's the, title, like I read the title book. of the book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I promise you. I promise you. Bring it in your bathroom. 
<laughs> put it in your bathroom. Every time you go to the bathroom, open it up. And whoever you're living with, they'll say, why are you laughing? And you'll say, it's the book, honey. It's the book. <laughs> you know, that's how good it is. I get I get comments all the time. Nobody's ever read a book like this. Well, folks, um, for, for people, people for people listening, because this is a podcast and a YouTube. Oh, we're still series. going. So yeah, yeah, we're, we're still going, man. It's it's. Okay, uh, let me we're, say, we're, let me we're, say we're, one we're more wrap, thing. Too. We're wrapping up, but yeah. Um, let me say two more things. Oh, yeah, say, say I want a PR. <laughs> I want a PR to two people. All right. Okay. Michael Matsuda, the Martial Art History Museum, Burbank, California, and Travis Wong. That's Travis Wong, the Jam. Okay, in in Los Angeles, California. Please go see the museum when you're in town. Thank you. And Every also for people listening, Stephen Lambert from the streets of Brooklyn to the halls of Hollywood. You can get the Kindle edition or paperback on Amazon. It's at a very affordable rate, under 25 bucks, folks. So yeah, definitely check it out. It'll be in the episode notes as well on YouTube in the video description. You can check there and pick up the book and read it. Do you know be, better, be better than me. <laughs> it's like a finger. <laughs> all right y'all thanks for checking out social jello and angelo and i'll catch you all next time peace stay safe